Well, good evening, Parkview. Everybody doing well tonight? So this is the group, I guess, that your football team's not playing right now, right? So you're, you're here or you're in the middle of a game. Uh, thank goodness for recording games, right? You can just go anytime uh, you'd like. And I also like recording games also because as you can just press pause and it keeps you in good relations with your wife, right? Remember the old days when you had to keep it alive? Uh, how many are old enough to remember that? All right, it was good to see you here tonight. We're so thankful. My name is Jack. I'm the family ministries pastor here. Uh, it's my joy to serve here at Parkview Church. And just remind you of the few ways to give you can see behind me. There's four ways to give, and we encourage you to give um, to the Lord. We're thankful for the way God provides each and every week, and um, not only our mission here at Parkview, but around the world. We have a lot of exciting things that are coming up in family ministries, and the one that's right around the corner, we want to give you just an opportunity, is Trunk or Treat. Each year for Trunk or Treat, there's no doubt, somewhere throughout the year, it could be six months later, it could, al it could almost be the next year. We have somebody that comes to our church, and we ask them, how did you find out about Parkview? And undoubtedly, we have many people say, we came through Trunk or Treat. It's a great opportunity for us to reach out in the community. We have over 3,000 people that come through for Trunk or Treat uh, each year. And so we need your help. You say, well, how can I help? Well, first of all, you can donate some candy. We have over 120,000 pieces of candy that we give out to the community. Um, we also have many different ways that you can serve. We have candy runners. We have greeters. We have those that can help with parking. Um, and most importantly, we have, if you would like to host a trunk, and decorate up a trunk, that would be great. Already this weekend, I think I counted it up, we have about 18 trunks already, and we only have 45. So if you're someone here that loves to have a trunk, I believe within the next week, um, we're going to have all the trunks filled up. So I would encourage you to go ahead and fill up the trunks if that's what you want to do, and go ahead and register. So we can't wait um, for this event to happen. Also, want to make a plug for each and every um, Sunday evening, Right here at 5 o'clock, uh, we have Overflow, which is our student ministry here. That is students that would be from 6th through the 12th grade, and um, they have small groups. Uh, each of the girls up through 6th, 7th, 8th, ninth, they have separate uh, small groups along with the guys. And um, we have over 100 students sometimes here on campus on Sunday evening. So I wanted you to make sure that you know that, and um, if you know of someone, send them our way on Sunday evening. Now, how many are really intrigued with the story of Deion Sanders? That's a pretty interesting. It's amazing how he can come to a program and fill in coaching and completely change it around. So what it tells you is coaching makes a difference, right? And I'm so thankful here for the team that God has assembled together, not only with our staff and our pastoral staff, but also our team those of you that are sitting here, this is just a tremendous team that we get to serve on here at, at Parkview. And I want to introduce our newest member because uh, him and his wife, they are in the family ministry uh, here at Parkview. So uh, April and Warren, why don't you come on out here. I want to introduce you to our brand new children's pastor, our kids pastor here at Parkview. Uh, we're already excited about what God's going to be doing uh, in their ministry, and um, we're so thankful to have them here on staff. I think Pastor Greg is an absolute genius with those that he brings on staff. We have some great quality people. I uh, already know they have a servant's heart. April, you were here last night till after 11 o'clock uh, helping us serve, so we're so thankful for them. And I'm going to ask him today, could you open our services here in a word of prayer, and then you're going to get right over to the kids' room, right? Yeah, for sure. All right, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Sure. If you guys will bow your heads and your hearts with me. Lord, we come before you and we thank you for this glorious day, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to come to Parkview and to worship you. We pray that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our heart are pleasing and acceptable to you. We thank you for your grace and your mercy in our lives. Uh, Lord, accept our worship uh, as sweet sounds to your ears. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. 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 Let's all stand together and worship our King. to be in the house of the Lord. Do you agree? Yeah. Sing with me. All creatures of our God and King. 
lift your voice. Lift up your voice and with us sing. Oh, praise Him. Oh, praise Him. Oh, praise Him. Thou burning sun with golden beam. Thou silver moon with softer gleam. Oh, praise Him. Oh, praise Him. Hallelujah.
It's so good. Church, we're going to continue to worship. I don't want to make you guys stand. If you guys feel like you want to sit, uh, this next song uh, comes from um, the idea of, of, of our statements of faith, what we believe as Christians and why we believe it. So Matt's going to sing this next song. And if you want to keep standing, you can. If you want to have a seat, you can too. There's freedom in this house. We're going to sing a song called We Believe. I love this song. I hope you do too. Let's continue to worship together. time of desperation when all we know is doubt and fear there is only one foundation we believe we believe in this broken dark you help us see there is only one salvation we believe we believe we believe in God the Father we believe in Jesus Christ we believe in the Holy Spirit and He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection and He's coming back again. We believe. So faith be more than anthems greater than the songs we sing and in our weakness and temptations we believe we believe yeah we believe in God Christ, we believe in the Holy Spirit, and He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion, we believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection, and He's coming back again. Let the lost be found, and the dead be raised, and the healed. Love in vain, let the church 
church sing aloud A God will say we believe, we believe And the gates of hell will not prevail For the power of God has torn the veil Now we know your love will never fail We believe, we believe We believe in God the Father We believe in Jesus Christ We believe that he conquered death We believe in the resurrection And he's coming back He's coming back again He's coming back
mountains shake before him, the demons run and flee. At the mention of the name, King of Majesty, there is no power in hell. Thank you so much for the time of worship. I pray that our worship is a sweet aroma to your, to your eyes, to your ears, Lord. I pray that you are worshiping this time. We love you and we praise you. Amen. Have a seat, church. Amen. Amen. Wow. Every, so many times I just want to like start the service over again, you know, and just like begin to worship again. It is great to see you here tonight. Thanks so much for being a part of our service. It is a joy not only to have you, but also to have our dear friend, Caitlin Kelly, with us. And uh, Caitlin is, this is not her first time here at Parkview. She has been here on multiple occasions. Some of you may remember her giving her testimony and sharing her story last summer. And uh, to kind of maybe trigger your memory a little bit, uh, the way that I became introduced to Caitlin was uh, she met a uh, partying young lady on a university campus challenged that young lady uh, to turn her life towards Jesus and then discipled her and that young lady to this day is on fire for Jesus and that young lady just so happens to be my niece and um, yeah so uh, Caitlin was used greatly by the Lord to uh, invest in Morgan uh, Denise's uh, niece and uh, so it's great to have you back, Caitlin. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having and, me. And um, give us a little bit of a um, connection point here. You came last summer. Yes. And that was your, kind of your first introduction to our church. You were back this summer again serving. We'll get to that in a moment. But last summer when you came in, you had a new opportunity in front of you, and you had some goals in front of you. So talk about how that played out for you. Yeah. So last year I came um, because Morgan reached out to me and said that she wanted to introduce me to her aunt and uncle. Uh, little did I know that they were the pastor of this awesome church, um, <laughs> which is really cool. And I had just graduated college and I was considering going to grad school or going on staff with a college ministry, which is uh, the ministry that has come this summer and um, the one that Morgan was involved in too. And so um, instead of going and staying at the college I was at, they were launching me to a different campus. And so I got to go to the University of Central Arkansas and get to do that there as well. And they were, they really needed more girls on staff. There was only one. And so that was, they were <laughs> really struggling and needed some more girls to go. And I was willing to go. And so I came because I was raising support to go. And I came here, and you guys really did um, boost me and launch me to that campus. If I didn't come here, I probably would have not met all the girls I met, and who would have known? Yeah. yeah. What God does. So yeah. Morgan came over to the house one night, and uh, she said, uh, hey, Uncle Greg Anthony, so I've got this friend. She's uh, really special to me, and she, like, helped me turn my life around, and then she discipled me and mentored me. And I was wondering, like, if you could meet her, and like she's only allowed to come here like kind of the guidelines are she could come and be here the summer while I'm here but only if she's like raising support because she's trying to get to her target ministry and you don't have to support her or anything but like if you could like maybe consider it 
and we can bring her, and then maybe, you know, but that's okay, whatever, and she was real cute about it, and I said, Morgan, uh, if this young lady means a lot to you, then why don't you do this? Why don't you call her and get her an airplane ticket and tell her to go ahead and come as soon as she can get here while you're here? And so she's like, seriously? I'm like, no, seriously, just we'll, we'll cover it. Um, your aunt is good for the ticket price. And um, <laughs> so um, Caitlin came, and we, of course, not only loved Morgan, but we fell in love with Caitlin so much. We were like, I said, hey, I kind of asked you to stay over for the weekend um, for a reason. I, I want you to kind of share your story. And so, yeah, you had a lot of money that needed to be raised, and Parkview was a huge part of that, and then launching you uh, at the University of Central Arkansas. Um, so talk a little bit about kind of what happened last year, maybe a little bit, and then kind of what you're seeing like right now in real time, because this is a very busy season of ministry for you yes. uh, right now. So thanks for giving up your time to come oh, here just this weekend. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so last year, uh, I was just getting on campus. Um, I came to Parkview probably 30% funded, and I wasn't feeling discouraged, but just a little. And um, if you know, if you heard my story, uh, my parents are not following Christ. They kind of just said, good for you. Uh, and they kind of, I feel like they were waiting for me to fail, and I was like, nope, I know God is so faithful, and that's not going to happen. And so when I came here, I was like at 30%. And when I left, I probably was around 80 or more mm, percent. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then God was, <laughs> you know how he does that? And like, it just starts going really fast. And before I knew it, I was on campus before school even started last year. And mm. I remember like when I accepted the job, I was like, I will be on campus in mm. August. And God did it. And he really did do it through this church. And I'm super grateful. But mm. um, right now, Campus is crazy. There's a million, not million, but you know, a ton of students <laughs> on campus. And um, for us, we really are eager to meet the new students. So the freshmen on campus and uh, yeah, just the ones that we want to hopefully one day initiate with the gospel. And so we call this season uh, our sewing broadly season. So we're sewing, we, we don't want to just meet one student who's hungry. We want to meet, you know, as many as we can because not all of them will become uh, seeds out of good soil. So, yeah, that's what we're doing right now, meeting a lot of students, uh, going to the cafeteria for every meal. Um, <laughs> it's not that great, but <laughs> it's worth it. It's worth it. Yeah. So it's been awesome. So when you got there last year, the, you know, the ministry was a lot smaller than it is today. Yes. So they had students, not this past mm -hmm. summer, the previous summer, go to Kaleo, which is their summer intensive Discipleship. Yeah. So, talk a little bit about what Stumo is your is the ministry you're part of, but the summer yes. program is called Kaleo. Talk about kind of what happened from year to year and and what what that summer intensive looks like for those students. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So the ministry is called Student Mobilization. We shorten it. We call it Stumo. Some people think it's Sumo, like sumo wrestling. <laughs> but that's not it. Um, and so our purpose is to build up. Um, leaders for Christ on the college campuses and so that we can send them out into every part of the world. Um, and so what we do is we plant ourselves on college campuses and we make it our, our vision and our task is to meet with those students and hopefully see them become um, followers of Jesus and take that with them when they graduate and whatever they do after college. And so Kaleo, uh, like you were saying, nine-week uh, pr discipleship program and basically students will come and they'll learn how to read their Bible, how to share their faith, how to do, I mean, a million things that I had never, I didn't even know that people read their Bible, you know? And so they come and they, it's like you was saying, it's very intensive, but it's fun. You know, we make it fun. We, it's out Florida, so that, that really helps, mm -hmm. the beach. Mm -hmm. And um, How many students were here in Flagler County as a part of Kaleo this summer, Caitlin? This summer, there's about 200. Mm. with our project which was great it mm -hmm. was crazy um we could we wanted them to come here all of them but that would they wouldn't have fit yeah. um yeah so that was really cool and with uca the summer prior we had 18 students come which is a big was a big deal um and this year we had 50 mm. and that was mm -hmm. crazy mm -hmm. and wow. when i decided to go on staff i remember sitting in a meeting and there was eight students and i was thinking hmm I know this is what God wants me to do, but eight students, and now we have uh, 
48 involved in our leadership and who want to go on campus and labor who came back from Kaleo. Mm. And that would, I mean, that's wow. two, three years of God working. Wow. And so that, I just get really fired up when I, I see that room of students who really want to multiply their life in college. Mm. So I just can't think of, um, for my wife and I, a greater investment that we make. And we invest broadly in missions, but being able to invest in you and that next generation and going out on the University of Central Arkansas campus, which is one of many campuses that yes. student mobilization is on, but to be able to specifically partner with you and to be able to see the fruit of your labor and then watching what you do all year long kind of you know, multiply and manifest itself when you bring students here, right here to our town Absolutely. in the summer and be able to disciple throughout the summer. And, and, and so it's just amazing church of uh, what opportunities there. I, every time I get her newsletter, I'm quick to read it, excited about it. I'm regularly praying for the girls that she tells us to pray for. And so I would encourage you to stop by and see Caitlin in the lobby afterwards. She's got a little uh, QR code, email, website. You can get all the information for her ministry. Uh, I'd also encourage you to consider uh, a monthly support if that's where you feel led. We'll also have a bucket out there in the lobby um, that you can give cash or a check to, church, just write the check to the church. We'll give every penny goes to her. So last year she came, said like 30% support left with like yeah. 80% support. It was crazy. And, and, you know, in our private conversations, Denise, myself, we were talking with you, and you said, you know, what's neat is not just that people, part you've been, like, giving me resources financially, but a lot of people have just cared and stayed in touch and sent emails and just kind of been, you know, staying in contact with her. And so, like, that's, that's what it looks like to partner in ministry. And so I'm just grateful for Caitlin and thankful for our church and thankful that we get to host in the summertime. I think about 40 of the 200 that are in the county, about 40, 45 yeah. come to church here on the weekends and so in the summer. So they're coming back again next summer. So this is kind of a, uh, a great opportunity for us to just link up, join hands, and partner uh, with Caitlin. And uh, let me just pray for your ministry Thanks. and uh, that in this, in this sowing broadly season. I love that. Father, just... Um, these young people are coming on the college campus many of them as freshmen They're like come i don't know anybody or i don't know many people i'm away from home this is brand new i'm kind of not really sure what i'm going to do with my life and maybe i'll just start partying harder maybe i'll just kind of you know if i could just meet somebody that'll be solve all my problems and then here ready um caitlin stands with the gospel of jesus christ which will transform from the inside out and we are seeing not just fruit, but fruit that remains. We're seeing fruit that multiplies. And so, Lord, I am thankful that um, in a very special way, in a very tangible way, Parkview gets to partner up. And um, I pray that this weekend will be a blessing to Caitlin uh, as her supporters kind of, hey, go and see her again, thank her, kind of just connect with her, all those that have been partnering this past year with her. But then new partners, new investors, new prayer partners, even new people that will just get the newsletter and be praying specifically for the girls by name that Caitlin asked us to pray for throughout the year. And uh, Lord, I can't think of a, a better group to reach. Um, man, I just am excited about this and what you're doing. And I pray your biggest, most abundant and bountiful blessings over Caitlin's ministry. In your name we pray and all God's people said, amen. 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 Thank you so much, Caitlin. Thanks. Let's thank her for being with us, if you would. Well, if you have your Bible, I want you to go to Ephesians chapter number 2. We're going to hang out and park in Ephesians chapter 2 a little bit this evening. Um, and I think what I'll do is I'll kind of, we started a brand new series last week. So I, I think I have an illustration that will help kind of take us back to what we did last week. Let me grab this real quick and uh, where we got started at. So um, we're in a series entitled The Five Solas. Now the five solas are the fundamentals and the foundation of our faith that were born out of the Reformation, uh, uh, the Protestant Reformation 500 plus years ago when Martin Luther nailed the 95 Thesis on the door. Now, I, I won't take time to repeat some of the history that we looked at last week, and I don't normally ask you specifically to go watch a sermon if you missed it, 
but I really would encourage you, if you didn't catch last week, go back, because it'll help lay the foundation for where we're going uh, throughout the series, okay? So there are, there are the five solas, and, and sola is a Latin word that means alone. And so the five solas are uh, scripture alone, grace alone, faith alone, Jesus Christ alone, the glory of God alone. Or in uh, Latin, sola scriptura, scripture alone. In Latin this week, uh, sola gratia, or, or grace alone. Now, to just kind of help illustrate, um, there's a book uh, written by one of the greatest golfers to ever play the game, a golfer by the name of Ben Hogan. And uh, his book is entitled um, Ben Hogan's Five Lessons. And it's the modern fundamentals of golf. And Hogan says, if you can get these five things down in golf, you will, in a, in a crazy way, improve your game. And, and if, you just, if you didn't know anything else about golf, but you could get these five fundamentals down. The first fundamental is the grip. You, you have to know how to properly hold the golf club. The second thing he says is the stance. So you not only have to know how to hold the club, but you need to know how to stand and address the golf ball. He says that the second, or third rather, uh, fundamental of modern golf is the, the backswing. So you got the grip, the stance, the backswing, and then, then he calls it the follow-through, coming through the ball, and then he says the finish. So what you need to be a really good golfer is you need to know the grip, the stance, the backswing, the follow-through, and the finish. And I've played a lot of golf with guys that I can tell you have no idea about these five things. I love playing golf. Played, played this week. In fact, it was my, I was so excited to play. It was the first time I played in seven weeks since I had orthoscopic knee surgery, and I could not wait to play again. And I did pretty good, just so you know. Just so you know, just, you're probably wondering how did it go. Did pretty good. So, but I've watched guys play golf, and I'm thinking to myself, you guys don't know these five fundamentals. So if you've never seen Hogan swing, I think we've got a video. Watch this. This is a, this, if you're a golfer, this is, this is beautiful. And just watch this. This, my friend, is how a golfer is to swing the golf club. One of the greatest golfers to ever play. And in his book, he'll, he'll teach you the five fundamentals that will help you swing like that. Now, some of you guys that are playing golf, your golf swing is so far from that. In fact, I'd take two weeks off and quit. That's what I'd do. Now, here's what I think, though. I think that just as much as there are some golfers who play but are pretty miserable... I think there are oftentimes there are some Christians that kind of are in the same boat. They're following Jesus, but they don't enjoy it. There's no real joy. It's more duty or obligation. It's more like list checking and responsibility and tradition. They don't really, they're not growing, they're not flourishing. They're not enjoying their faith. I think if you just got the five fundamentals down, don't worry about everything else. Be like, but I don't know much, Pastor. Yeah, just, yeah, that's fine. Don't worry about it. Just do what you know to do. And take the opportunity to grow in it. And so this series really is largely about getting the fundamentals down, the, the grip, the stance, the backswing, the, the follow-through, and the finish. It is grace alone, Scripture alone, faith alone, Jesus Christ alone, the glory of God alone. Those five things will, in a radical way, transform the joy that you find in your faith and in Christ. And so this weekend, we want to look in Ephesians chapter number 2 at grace alone. Ephesians chapter number 2 will begin in verse number 8 and read just a few verses. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. It says, for by what? Grace. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Now, now what I want to point out is you are not saved by your faith. You're saved by grace through your faith. Okay, so we, 
It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift. Say gift. It is the gift of God, not a result. Not, no, no sir, no ma'am. Not a result of works, because then you could just brag about it. Verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. Now, not only is this text famous in Ephesians chapter 2, but it is also foundational. It is foundational from the standpoint of Paul gives a great uh, understanding and explanation of what grace looks like in the life of a believer. Now, this may be hard to uh, imagine, but the word grace is actually found in the New Testament 156 times. Now, remember, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer here, but I always say when God repeats something over and over again, there must be a reason. Not only is grace found 156 times in the New Testament, but it is found in Paul's letters over 100 times. Now, I believe that Paul talked about grace so much because he had experienced it so deeply. Now, Paul wrote from Romans to Philemon 13 letters, nine to churches, four to individuals, 13 letters, 14 if you think Hebrews was one of his. We're not def definite on that. But certainly he wrote 13 from, from Romans to Philemon, nine to churches, four to individuals, and over 100 times in those 13 letters he talked about grace. Because not only is grace something that is foundational for our faith, but it is famous in the Scriptures. Paul said uh, to the Romans in Romans chapter 3, in verse number 23, he says, For all, say all, all have sinned and what? So all have sinned and fall. All fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his what? So justified, or justification, is a big kind of theological word. I like to say it like this. Justification, or being justified, means just as if I never sinned. So, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Or Titus chapter 2, uh, Paul wrote, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Now, the reason that grace is so desperately needed in your life and my life is because we need to be rescued. Grace is so needed because we desperately need to be rescued. About five weeks ago, I'm not sure, I thought it was this was pretty cool. Not sure. It was like August 10th or 11th, so five, six weeks ago, little Flagler Beach made the national news. I don't know if you saw this or not, but the way that Flagler Beach made the national news was rather interesting. A guy was working in a tattoo shop down in Flagler Beach, and he was taking a break, and during his break, he decided to fly his drone. And when he took a break from the tattoo shop and flew his drone, he just so happened to catch four Flagler Beach lifeguards that had formed a chain with their rescue devices, and all four of them had kind of that, that flotation device on a string, and then it was grabbed by the next lifeguard, and then grabbed by the next lifeguard, and then grabbed by the next lifeguard, and they went out, and they got a swimmer out of the rip current, and they literally saved the kid's life from drowning and all of it was caught on this drone and it made national news it's a super cool video if you have not seen it but they rescued the kid from the rip current and what we are being pulled under by is the current of this culture and I, I submit to you today we need the grace of God as sin tries to pull us under I would say this, our greatest need, your greatest need, my greatest need is the grace of God. And the reason for this grace and its great need is because we have a problem. 
And by the way, our biggest problem in America is not inflation. It's not gas prices. It's not mortgage rates. It's not politics. Our, 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 our greatest problem is not the, the presidential election coming up. Our greatest problem is not the president's son. It's not COVID. It's not uh, the threat of war. It's not global warming. None of those things are our greatest problem. Our greatest problem problem is sin and because sin is the greatest problem in america we need to be rescued from the current of this culture that pulls us not towards christ but pulls us away from christ and pulls us towards sin and so whether you acknowledge it or not friend doesn't matter your greatest problem is sin therefore the greatest blessing is grace because it can rescue us from drowning in the sin that so tries to pull us under. And every single person is desperate of needing to be saved from sin. If we go back to Ephesians chapter number 2 and look at verses 1 through 3, we'll go kind of backtrack a little bit on that famous text of grace. Verses 1 through 3, it says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sin in which you once walked following the course of this world following the prince of the power of the air the spirit is now at work in the sons of disobedience among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh carrying out the desires of the body and the mind and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind i love actually the opening phrase of those three verses it says and you were dead in the trespasses and sins i love that analogy you were dead in your sin understand this friend jesus did not come say not he did not come to make good people better he came to make dead people alive that's why jesus came he did not come to make good people better. He came to make dead people alive because we were dead in our trespasses and our sins. Verse number four, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved you see the solution to the problem will not be found in us and could never be found in us because apart from jesus we were dead you and i are saved by god's grace alone if we were to define grace i think this would be a sound working definition grace is unmerited favor undeserving loving kindness it is unmerited favor. That's what God's grace is. It is undeserving, loving kindness, which, by the way, little asterisks here about grace. Grace is actually what sets Christianity apart from all other world religions. It's the one thing that sets us apart from all other religions because every other religion has a strong tie to works. It is Christianity that is built upon the foundation of grace, God's unconditional love, and forgiveness a message of grace matthew henry said this grace is the free undeserved goodness and favor of god to mankind charles spurgeon said grace is the overflow of god's love freely and unconditionally given to those who do not deserve it jerry bridges said grace is god's favor and mercy bestowed upon us not because of anything we have done but because of who he is grace unmerited favor undeserving loving kindness and by the way i'll tell you something else that grace will do grace will give you security and confidence to face everything in your life that you don't really want to face apart from grace grace will give you the confidence and the courage to face the good, bad, and the ugly without fear of condemnation or retribution from God. Grace allows us to face, in a very powerful and secure place, face the truth about ourselves. 
the good, bad, and the ugly, and not worry about being condemned for it. So you're like, Pastor, but God could never forgive me. Like, you, you have no idea what I've ever done. Friend, grace will give you the security to face what you've done and not have to worry about being condemned. In fact, Paul said, it's what, the eighth chapter in verse number one of Romans, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation from him. It's grace. I, I condemn myself a lot more than God condemns me. I do. Anybody else in here ever get hard on yourself? You ever sin and get really ticked off and hacked at yourself? I mean, just to get mad, because you're like, this is so stupid. Why did I do that? I mean, the other day, I'm not really a cusser, but the other day I was praying, I, like, I, just, I just like wanted to cuss. I mean, I was like so mad at myself. And God knew it, so I just was like, there it is, Lord. That's what I'm thinking. It's that word. And I'm just like, this stuff, I'm like, boom. And, and I wasn't cussing at God. I'm just thinking about how frustrated I was at myself. But grace gives us the courage to face that stuff. Romans chapter 11, verses 5 and 6 says, So too at the present time there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. <laughs> okay, what we've got to do here is we've got to look at grace and works because this is what Luther was furious about. Remember, the, the main driver that caused him to put the 95 Thesis up that day was that uh, John Tetzel was over there in Germany having been sent by Pope Leo X out of Rome to raise money to build St. Peter's Basilica. He had been sent over to sell indulgences. And so if we can buy down our sin, friend, that is a work. That is a deed. That is an effort. That is something on our part that we're doing to solve our sin problem. And here's 95 reasons, Luther said, you can't earn God's favor. It is unmerited. It is undeserved. It is the loving kindness and favor of God. And he's saying, it is not only do we stand on Scripture alone and not some traditions and what a pope says or what a church says or what a denomination says, it doesn't matter what, and that's why, by the way, that's why here at Parkview, like, you never really ever hear me talk about denomination, because it's not about denomination. It's about the Bible. It's about the gospel. It's about Scripture. It's about what does God's Word say. So we started last week with Scripture alone. And then this week we move into it, to, uh, grace alone, because Luther was just saying, like, this is what we're, we're, uh, we're trying to reform here. The church has kind of wandered away. He wasn't trying to split the church. He wasn't trying to divide the church. He wasn't trying to sell it down the river. He was just trying to bring some reformation about. Now, how it played out ended up a little different than what he thought it would. But, but what he was trying to say is, if it's of grace, it can't be of works. And if it's of works, it can't be of grace. It's one or the other. The two are mutually exclusive one to the other. Because we are saved by grace, and we looked at that in a number of passages already. Because we are saved by grace, we cannot also be saved by works. Because grace and works are mutually exclusive one to the other. They are of the opposite character. And the one who establishes the one overturns the other. So salvation by grace is of God, it is by God, and it is through God and what he has done. Salvation doesn't rest on me or anything that I could do or have ever done. See, now, works and grace are mutually exclusive. Now, works are a part of our eternal reward, but they are not a part of our eternal life. Works are a part of our eternal reward, but they're not a part of what brings eternal life. Works bring a reward. And so attached to the works is a sense of debt, right? Because you work, and then you're to get a reward for that work. And so attached to that work and that reward is a sense of debt. So therefore, a reward is not a free gift. Track with me here. A reward is not a free gift because it's attached to effort and it's attached to a deed. 
So works bring a reward, and that's attached to a debt. If a debt has been entirely paid, then there is nothing left to be paid. So when it comes to our salvation, Jesus paid the full debt. Jesus paid the full price of our guilt. And how did he pay for it? By his blood. Through grace, by his blood, he paid for our debt. So we do not get saved by a work. We do not get saved by an act. We do not get saved by a deed. We do not get saved by a tradition. We do not get saved by a ritual. Not only do we not get saved by a word, an act, a deed, a ritual, or a tradition, we also don't fall away from grace by a word, an act, a ritual, or a tradition. If you don't get saved by a work, you don't lose salvation by a work because salvation is all based upon grace. Nothing you could do or would do, nothing that I could do or would do. It is the undeserving, unmerited favor and loving kindness of God. I love this math equation that really summarizes what grace is, and it's this. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. It's not Jesus plus me. It's not Jesus and a little bit of works. It's Jesus plus nothing equals everything. The medieval church had begun to teach that unless you did some sort of action, God would not bestow grace on your life. Unless there was some ritual or tradition or action of beha or behavior, then God wouldn't bring grace. It was kind of like what it was happening in the church was that God had become the grace Nazi. And no grace for you because you've not done anything to kickstart the grace of God. Friend, if you and I could do something to kickstart the grace of God, it wouldn't be grace. It'd be works. And our salvation would be connected to what we're doing. It's not connected to what we're doing. It's connected to what he has already done. And so I submit to you, grace is a person, and his name is Jesus Christ. By grace alone, in faith in Christ's saving work, and not because of any merit on our part, we are accepted by God, and then we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit who renews our hearts while equipping us and calling us to good works. Now, I said last week, you don't get, you can't front load salvation with works, and you can't back load salvation with works. Salvation is an act of grace. It's a work of grace in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, while we, now here's what I want you to, now, I, I know we're, we're not, we don't have our floaties on hanging out in the kiddie pool tonight. So I appreciate our understanding of that. We don't get saved by our works. We get saved by grace. Grace alone. Now I don't come in to salvation by works and I don't stay in salvation by works. It's, it's a work of grace on behalf of Jesus Christ. Now because I am saved, I should be doing good works. It's interesting. If you go back to Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. Now, don't confuse the two. Works is not attached to our getting eternal life. Works is attached to our getting an eternal reward. But we are, at verse 8 of chapter 2, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Now, verse 10. For we are as workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, Paul, who wrote much about grace, is also, he tries to help us understand how grace brings salvation, and then out of that salvation, yes, there are good works that are to be manifested. That's the intention that God has for us. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9. It says, He has saved us and called us to a holy life, you understand that? He saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of anything that we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. So this grace is not because of what we've done, but because we have received this grace, we are to, the first part of the verse. We're called to live a holy life. John Wesley said this, he said, grace is the divine assistance or heavenly influence that God gives us to enable us to overcome sin and live righteously. 
I submit to you that grace not only works for our salvation, grace works for our sanctification. Grace works for our salvation. That's how we come to faith in Jesus Christ. But grace then goes on to work in our sanctification. And sanctification is just a big word for becoming like Christ. Now that we are in Christ, his plan is that we will become more like Christ. See, grace is not just the beginning of salvation, but it is the atmosphere through which we step in and through our sanctification. And grace is not God's way of just overlooking our imperfections, but grace is God's way of transforming those imperfections. Grace is not a license to do whatever you want. Grace helps you do what you should. So grace doesn't just get us to where we come to faith in Christ, but then it helps us grow in Christ. So the question then is, okay, we don't get saved by works. We get saved by grace alone, through faith alone. But if we're really living in grace, what, how does that grace manifest itself? And this is where the rubber meets the road. Because it's not just good enough for our salvation, but grace ought to be displayed in our sanctification. And how do we put grace on display tonight, tomorrow, at work, in the house, dealing with the kids, dealing with the neighbors, working with your boss? How is grace put on display? Well, grace is on display in our lives when we, first of all, have a spirit of humility. You'll know that grace is on display in your life when you have a spirit of humility. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what was written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If you didn't receive it then, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? So this whole thing was going on in the early church, and some people were saying, well, like, I like Apollos better, and I like Paul better, and uh, you know, I like so-and-so, and Paul's like, stop all the nonsense. How can somebody be like choosing sides and pretending like they're better? Like, if, if, Stop thinking you're better, Paul's saying. Stop thinking he's better, she's better, you're better. No, we've all just come into this by grace. And so let's not be puffed up about it. If you ever come in contact with a staff member that think they own this place, come see me, will you? <laughs> you ever run into an elder around here that thinks they own this place, come see me, will you? And by the way, you ever think, I feel like I own this place, go see a staff member or go see an elder. I loved it. I, it was my favorite thing about sabbatical this summer was the church's largest growth spurt in our history. And I came back week one and I said, all that tells us is two things. One, who is not the hero maker? And number two, who is the hero maker? It's Jesus. We're not seeing what happened, what happens around here because of somebody other than Jesus Christ and Christ alone. He said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto myself. He said, I, he said uh, the, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And he may use you and he may use me like he was using Paul and like he was using Apollos, but don't walk around acting like you're God's gift to the church and God's gift to the kingdom and God's gift to ministry. God could do this without you. He'd do this without me. He doesn't need me. The only reason I'm pastor is I got here first. Other than that, there's no real reason for this. Uh -huh. my, one of my favorite taglines, I'm just one beggar telling another beggar where I found bread, that's all. It's not because of you, it's not because of me. Your small group go grows, good. Give God the glory, don't take it yourself. You see God do something phenomenal in your student group, wonderful. Praise and glory to Jesus Christ. You don't, it's not about you, it's about Jesus Christ. Wherever God's blessing your ministry and flourishing your ministry, it's his ministry. Give him the glory for it. Because how grace ought to be on display in your life and my life is that, that we are, are humble about the work of God. 
Secondly, grace is on display in our lives not only when we have a spirit of humility, but when we have a heart to serve. We have a heart to serve. First Peter chapter 4, Peter said, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied what? So everybody's been gifted. Like, oh, pastor, you ain't never seen anybody any more Melba Toast than me. I, I just don't have anything really to offer the Lord. Friend, don't spit on the grace of God in your life. God has given everyone, each one of us, a gift. We were backstage laughing. I was laughing. I think I was laughing at myself. They were laughing at me. We were talking about when, as the choir was getting ready to come out, I was talking about how, how I asked them if I could sing with them, and they started laughing. And um, I sing so bad. And it's awful. It's awful. Like, like I, sometimes I'll be singing, and I'll just think to myself right in the middle of singing, I'm thinking, that's terrible. You're not even close. We were laughing about the fact that I can't sing. And I said, and, and worse than that, I, 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 no instrument. I couldn't play an instrument. And somebody just said, well, can you clap? I said, only on fast songs. I can't even clap on slow songs. I can't sing. I can't play an instrument. I can't clap. You're like, well, but, but pastor, do you sing? Yeah, for the glory of God. That's not exactly my gifting. I better figure out where my gifting is and then serve in that way. And so here at Parkview, here's what we want to do. We want to make it easy for you to be a steward of God's grace in your life. How do, we, how do we make it easy for you to be a steward of God's grace in your life? We say, sign up and serve, serve anywhere. Parkviewlife.com forward slash serve. Any of you ever use the internet? Anybody ever, ever use the internet? Anybody ever use an app? Go on the app, go on the internet, just click it, sign up to serve. You're like, where do I serve? Now listen, there's some, there's, this is how crazy it is around here. The, the people use their gifting in, in unique ways. Now listen to me, and you're going to be blessed by this, Okay. So tonight, when you leave in just a few minutes, depending on how much longer I preach, when you leave, <laughs> now you're really going to want me to finish. When you leave tonight, my understanding is that you're not only going to have pasta Alfredo with chicken on top. And I mean, and I don't mean microwave chicken and no Instapot chicken. I saw the guy out there grilling it on the grill grilling the whole breast of chicken and then slicing up the chicken and it's going on top of the alfredo pasta now get this i can't believe that this has actually happened here tonight but you're going to get breadsticks with that <laughs> now you listen to me and you listen to me good now listen to me you listen to what i'm telling you this makes good preaching right here are you ready for this you're about ready to I'm about ready to blow your mind. Those breadsticks tonight were made from scratch. <laughs> Let us pray. <laughs> huh? Now, you know what? Did not happen. I did not bake those breadsticks. I didn't stir those breadsticks. Whatever you, I don't, whatever you got to do to make a breadstick a breadstick, I didn't do it, but somebody did. And you know what somebody did tonight or some somebodies did tonight? They used their gifting. In fact, if you can't cook, don't sign up for the hospitality team. <laughs> we don't want to eat your food. Don't sign up for the hospitality team if you can't cook because we want homemade breadsticks. And listen to me, I'm telling you, if you're introverted, if you're cranky, if you're miserable, don't sign up for the Connections team. <laughs> and if you not only don't like children, you don't like your own children, don't sign up for student ministry. <laughs> but friend, sign up where you're gifted. Figure out where the Lord can use you. Why? So you can walk around saying, look at me, blow your own horn, talk about how good of a breadstick baker you are. No, sir, no, ma'am. This is for the grace of God. 
And this is a work of God's grace in our life. And we walk around with a spirit of humility and a heart to serve to further the mission of Jesus Christ in this world that all men who are dead can be made alive. Dear friend, I didn't design grace. I didn't develop grace. I don't deliver grace. I don't dispense grace. I don't dictate grace. I don't determine grace. Grace comes from God. So I don't dress it or decorate it like it's mine. It's God's gift to humanity. And he says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so, friend, we are recipients of grace alone. How? When I stand at the gate of heaven, if God were to say to me, why should I let you in? Friend, my answer is not baptism. My answer is not the family Bible I own. My answer is not some ritual, some tradition, some law, some ceremony. If he were to say to me, why do I let you in? Here's my answer. The grace of Jesus Christ. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that has been poured out upon me. If you are here, friend, and you do not know that heaven is your eternal home, friend, you may be able to get an eternal reward because of your works, but you ain't getting eternal life because of your works. This grace... If you're here and you don't know that heaven's your eternal home, my friend, jump yourself into God's grace. Ask him to forgive you of your sin and be your savior. Know that it is not of any work, deed, anything, action, nothing of yours, but God left the splendor of heaven, put on skin in the person of Jesus Christ, went to the cross and died on our behalf paid for our sin with his shed blood, rose again the third day, and offers us eternal life free. He came by the grace of God to bring salvation to all people, we read earlier. And all fall short, and all can have salvation, though, through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you do not know that heaven's your eternal home, jump into the grace of Jesus. Let him forgive you of your sin, be Lord and leader of your life. And then out of that grace... Not because of it, just out of it. Walk in humility and serve him. So that others can jump into that grace as well. I don't know. See, we, as people, we like to take credit for things. And I'm fearful sometimes as Christians, we take credit for not just the obtaining of salvation, but the maintaining of salvation. Both of those are a work of his grace. We like to take credit for it. Friend, don't take credit for being a believer, being a Christian, going to heaven. It's nothing you did. It's just the grace of God. We like to take credit for things. I take credit for things a lot of times that I I shouldn't even take credit for. That's on display a lot when we do like a family gathering and gifts are given out. Like just imagine our house on Christmas morning. Gifts are being given out. So when my you know, nephews or niece open up their Christmas gifts or my sister, brother-in-law, mom or dad, brother, sister-in-law, when they open up gifts, they're like, oh, Aunt Greg, Uncle Denise, or Aunt Denise, Uncle Greg, you know what I mean. <laughs> they're like, I got breadsticks on my mind, leave me alone. And um, I say, Aunt Denise, Uncle Greg, thank you so much. And this is what I say. Oh, you're welcome. We shopped everywhere for that gift. We went to three outlets, four malls. For months we thought about what you would prefer. And then I decided that was the gift. And I just go on and on. And you know what I do? I take, I take credit for all the gifts given. I, every birthday, every Christmas, anytime a gift is given, and our family gives gifts on Valentine's Day. That's the kind of family we are. But we just, when every time a gift's given, I take credit for it. But let me just tell you something, friend. If I'm being honest, I never bought a single gift. <laughs> My wife buys them all. She buys everything. And I try and take credit for it. I 
I'm not going to heaven because I bought it. I earned it. I paid for it. Can't take any credit for obtaining it. Can't take any credit for maintaining it. I didn't do a work to get it, and I'm not doing a work to keep it. It's all grace. If you don't know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, jump in. Ask him to forgive you of your sins and be your Savior. And jump into his grace. Because he loves you. It's, his un, it's the unmerited favor. It's the undeserving, loving kindness of God. It allows you to face what you wouldn't normally face and not fear any condemnation or judgment for us. You can see the good, the bad, the ugly in yourself and be okay with it and just bring it to Jesus and say, I'm sorry, forgive me, and here I am. I just need your grace. Some of you have been thinking that when you get to heaven, you're just going to tell them about how much good you did. Some of you are just hoping there's, a, there's, a, there's some sort of scale up there that stuff gets thrown on, and you're going you're gonna to end up you know, being in favor. Friend, it's the grace of Jesus that gets you in and nothing else. And like I said a moment ago, if you've never trusted in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins and be your Savior, you'd pray a, a, a prayer of faith, something like this. You would just say to him tonight, God, thank you for your grace. I can't even wrap my mind around it totally, but thank you for your grace. Forgive me of my sins. Be Lord and leader of my life. I now trust you. I now place my faith in you. I receive your grace. Be Lord of my life. Friend, if, you, if you've never fallen and thrown yourself on the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why not tonight? Why not know that heaven's yours, not because of something you did, but because of everything he's done? And that, my friend, is a work of grace. And if you don't know that heaven's your eternal home, you make that prayer yours. That prayer I just prayed, God, thank you for your grace. It's amazing. Thank you for leaving heaven, coming down here, putting on skin. In the person of Jesus Christ, dying on the cross, paying for my sin debt through your shed blood, giving your life, rising again the third day, and offering me eternal life. I fall headlong into your grace. I now trust you as Lord and leader of my life. And you know what, friend? You don't need to bow your head. You don't need to close your eyes. You don't need to pray some fancy prayer. You, you can just say, that's, I want, that's me, Jesus. I want that tonight. I, I, I'll take your grace because I've never. I thought it was something about I, what I was supposed to do. I've been trying to check it off. Friend, it's His grace. And if tonight you're making a faith decision to trust by grace Jesus Christ and Christ alone, down front at our prayer area here, or out on the patio on your way out, there'll be a, a Bible with some information about what it looks like to place your faith in Jesus and fall on his grace and take him as your savior there's a bible and then there's some information in there for you that's designed because you just made a faith decision tonight you just said I'll take your grace that's a faith step that's a faith decision some people call it becoming a Christian being born again becoming a Jesus freak I don't name it whatever you want to name it but I'll take the grace of Jesus and what he did on the cross I'm asking her to forgive me of my sin and be my savior if that's your story tonight, friend, welcome to the family of God. And by the way, we're just a bunch of beggars telling other beggars where we found bread around here. And anything we've done, anything we're going to do, we didn't get it and we're not keeping it because of what we've done. It's all Jesus. It's all grace. Now together in this gospel community, we'll live with a spirit of humility and we'll serve others in God so that they can see grace on display and they can come and find grace themselves. What Luther was saying, this is the foundation of our faith. It's not only the Bible alone, but it is grace alone. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Grace is a person, and his name is Jesus. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for those who have jumped headlong into your grace tonight asking you to forgive their, them of their sins and be their Savior. I pray, Father, that they'll take 10 seconds and go to our prayer area or our 10 outside and just say, could I have a Bible, please? Because inside that Bible, that information will just be a help to them. It'll, it'll also help solidify in their heart tonight that this is the decision that I've made. 
I'm not trying to get into heaven because of what I've done. I'm trying to get into heaven just simply through what he's done, and I receive the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, I pray for those who have trusted you as Savior and jumped headlong into your grace tonight. And then, Lord, those of us who are believers, are Christians, are followers of Jesus Christ, may we, because of grace, have a perpetual spirit of humility serving you and others as a display of your great grace. Jesus, I'm thankful that this whole thing isn't hinging on what I've done or could do or should do. It all hinges on what you've done. And that's why we call it grace. Hey, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, why don't you just thank him for his great grace in your life? The undeserved loving kindness of God that's all over you. Just thank him for his grace. Lord, it is not only scripture alone, it is grace alone. In your name we pray. And all God's people said. Hmm. Thank you for loving the Bible and the preaching of his word. Enjoy your breadsticks. God bless you and have a